Uh, good, mo good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending the Kovaris CoLab. We are delighted to have you with us here this morning. We will have two presentations during this 30-minute session. Our first speaker, Byung Woo Kim, PhD candidate at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, will present on optimizing the chip sample preparation protocol using the Kovaris Adaptive Focus Acoustics Technology to study the epigenetic landscape in amyloid lateral sclerosis. Byung received his bachelor's degree in biochemistry from the University of Oklahoma in 2011. His research experience during his undergraduate years included studying the integration of phage display technology and nanomaterial for breast cancer cell imaging and treatment in the investigation of a membrane transport protein of a gram-positive bacterium, Corybacterium glutamisium. After B. Young's presentation, we will have Dr. Hamid Kojer, our principal scientist at Covaris, present on key and recently developed applications. We will also have some time at the end of pre the presentation to answer your questions. After the presentations, we invite you to visit the Covaris booth 1515 in the main exhibit hall to learn more about innovative uh, workflow solutions. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Byung Woo Kim to the podium to begin his presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Byung, and uh, I would like to first thank all of you for being here to, uh, uh, to listen to this talk. It's just a great opportunity for us to you know, present our data to you guys and share some tips and knowledge uh, that we got from ChipSeq uh, for the past uh, several months. And I'll just begin. So the title today is uh, Optimizing Chip Using Covariance Adaptive Acoust uh, Focus Acoustics, AFA, to study the transcriptional regulation of SOD1 in ALS pathogenesis. So just to briefly talk about the disease that we're studying and also the protein of our interest. The disease that we're studying is ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lugaris disease. I'm pretty sure uh, many of you sitting here have heard about Ice Bucket Challenge, um, which is an event to you know, promote and uh, raise funding for ALS research, and we study that disease. And this is a motor neuron disease. So in ALS patients, motor neurons uh, selectively and progressively degenerate and die. Because of that, uh, patients with the disease, um, their bodies get paralyzed, and they end up dying from respiratory failure. So this is a very fatal disease. Um, unfortunately, there's no effective therapy. There's only two uh, FDA-approved drugs, Rilazole and Idarabon, but they're not as effective as we hope. They only extend lifespan for about three to four months, and that's it. And superoxide dismutase 1, SOD1, or SOD1, is the protein that we're studying. This is mainly known as cytosolic enzyme. This is a key. Uh, what it usually does is that it destroys free superoxide radicals in the body, which is beneficial. But when it gets mutated, that's when the protein causes the disease. Over 150 mutations are there, and about uh, they're all poor mutations. Examples are A4V and G93A. Although this is known as cytosolic enzyme, uh, in 2012, we published a paper showing that there is a nuclear aspect of this SOD1 protein. And we confirmed that using mouse spinal cord sections, NAC34 cells. NAC34 cells is from mice, and it's a spinal cord motor neural-like cells. And we did some staining with SOD1 antibody, and we showed that in spinal cord sections, uh, SOD1 is present in the nucleus of motor neurons, and also interneurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes. And that is also confirmed in uh, NAC34 cells. Not only present in the nucleus, but this protein, SOD1, binds chromatin. So you can, as you can see on the upper right corner, we did Western blotting. So what we did here is we, we take um, ma brains and spinal cords of mouse, and then the subcellular fractionation. So you have three fractions. One is CE, which stands for cytosolic extract, and then soluble nuclear extract, and then chromatin nuclear extract. So as you can see, SOD1 is in the cytosolic extract, shown right here and then also in soluble nuclear extract. But what is more interesting is that it is in the chromatin-bound nuclear extract in both brains and spinal cord, suggesting that this protein binds chromatin. So the antibody that we used, its specificity was uh, spe uh, validated using SOD1 knockout mice. So as you can see, SOD1 is nicely stained in green in normal control mice, whereas you don't see any SOD1 signal in SOD1 knockout. So with this validated antibody, uh, the bottom line here is SOD1 is in the nucleus and it also binds chromatin. 
Uh, so we wanted to move forward and we wanted to know what exactly it does, what exactly this protein does inside the nucleus. And we hypothesized that nuclear SOD1 could act as a transcription factor or other type of chromatin modulator. In order to figure this out, our first approach was to figure out the binding site and genomic DNA. And that's why we use ChIP-seq. So this is the workflow of ChIP-seq. So you have your cells cross-linked so that your DNA and your protein will be cross-linked together. And then you isolate nuclei. Once you isolate nuclei, um, you shear chromatin inside of it. The ideal size range uh, in this case is around 150 to 700 base pairs for ideal um, sequencing. And then once you shear chromatin, you move on to the next step, which is immunoprecipitation. You incubate this uh, shear chromatin with antibody and then pull down your protein of your interest using this antibody. And that's immunoprecipitation. And then for sequencing, you want to get rid, rid of some of the unwanted stuff, for example, RNA or uh, proteins using RNAs A and proteinase K. And you only purify your DNA. And with this chip DNA purified, that's when you submit your sample for your sequencing and data analysis is followed. So this is the whole procedure of uh, ChIP-seq. And I'll just go over each step and explain about them and highlight some of the important points that needs to be considered for a successful result. So the first two steps are fixation and nuclear preparation. So for fixation, cross-linking time determination is very important. Um, usually, we recommend 2.5 and 5 minutes for primary or cell stem cells, and for all other cell types, 5 and 10 minutes. But again, this is highly cell type dependent, so this has to be determined empirically. And if you under cross link, this is problematic because that basically means that your protein and the DNA will cross link very weakly, which will affect the downstream application. And if you Oh, cross-link too much, that basically means that chromatin cannot be sheared to appropriate size. And also, the epitope of the protein will be masked so that antibody won't be able to bind to your epitope. So that's also problematic. problematic. So determining ideal uh, cross-linking time is critical. So once you determine that, and then you isolate nuclei. So in con conventional way, uh, what you can do is you can use buffer that contains mild detergent, which will dissolve or solubilize cell membrane or organelles. Uh, but depending on cell type, for example, iPS there are cells uh, which are very really sensitive. Um, they, they, uh, if you use this conventional method, uh, you'll have high contaminations of con uh, cytoplasmic portion, which will reduce your IP efficiency. In that case, uh, you can use what is called Nexin. Nexin stands for nuclear extraction by sonication. And with fixed cells, you basically sonicate using covariance AFA technology or using covariance um, ultrasonicator with AFA technology. So what you can do here is with fixed cells, you suspend in buffer. And then with that resuspension, you uh, sonicate using covariance sonicator in a mild setting for a certain amount of time. And then uh, you centrifuge, and then what you get in the pellet is your pure nuclei. And at the bottom section right here, with zero seconds, uh, you have intact cells. And as you increase the time of sonication in mild setting, you get more and more clean and pure nuclei. And the uh, quantification is done, and the graph is shown on the right side. So once you isolate nuclei, what you do next is chromatin shearing. You need to shear chromatin within the ideal size range. So again, we use covariance ultrasonicator. And the beauty of this uh, AFA technology or using this covariance ultrasonicator is that it basically uses high frequency and lower uh, wavelengths, shorter wavelengths, so that it can give focus energy, more focus energy to the cells, uh, to, to samples. So otherwise, if you, for example, have low frequency and very wide or longer wavelength, then they will give you a wider distribution of your fragment size, which is not what you want. And another good thing about this is that this ultrasonicator is water, ba water bath based, which means that the water temperature can be controlled so that your sample temperature can be controlled while it is being sheared. Uh, that's another good thing. So um, again, ideal size range is about 150 to 700 base pairs, and that can be confirmed using fragment analyzer, which I'll be showing in the next slide. And also, you can use gel electrophoresis to check that. Um, and the problem occurs if you undershear it, because that basically means you're not shearing enough uh, for a long time. 
so that uh, you will end up having a lot of large chunks of DNA. And also, if you overshear it, that basically means you'll end up having a lot of smaller sizes of DNA, which is not possible for sequencing. And also, your protein, target protein, can be denatured or um, degraded. And measuring DNA concentration after you shear chromatin is really important because um, you want to have high enough amount of uh, DNA in order to start IP. And uh, the graph on the right side is just showing that with Nexon technology, uh, you get more and more higher, high pure, highly pure um, nuclei, which can result in good uh, chromatin sharing result. So this is the result that we got from NSC34 cells. Uh, we did six minute sonication and uh, we run the sample uh, in fragment analyzer. And as you can see in the table on the right side, about 70% of the fragment DNA falls within this ideal range, 150 to 700. And that is also shown on the graph on the left side, highlighted in blue. You have very, most of your DNA fragments are within this 150 to 700 base pair range, which is good to start IP. Um, so with this chromatin shear, a shearing chromatin, you do IP. Usually you use about um, 2.5 to, two to five micrograms of antibody and 10 to 30 micrograms of chromatin. You combine those two and incubate at four degrees for about an hour up to overnight. And the result is shown right here on the right side. We did Western blotting using this IP samples. And as you can see, you see a lot, a lot of SOD1 band detected with samples pulled down by SOD1 antibody on the right plane, uh, whereas you don't see any SOD1 band detected with the IgG pull down sample, suggesting this, is a good, this was a good IP. And also, it is always good to check IP efficiency. You can do this by using RTQPCR. Um, so we can. Uh, it is really. It's not possible to do with SOD1 antibody at this in this case because SOD1 is presumably we think it's it's a, it, it can act as a transcription factor, but we don't know its binding site yet. That's why uh, we use in this case histone H3 antibody as a positive control. Um, histone H3, as most of you know, it's a chromatin binding protein and its binding sites are well known. One of its binding sites is GAP-DH. It binds to a promoter region of GAP-DH, so we use that as a positive control and for a negative control, mouse IgG. And the flow enrichment is shown on the graph on the right side. As you can see, the sample that was pulled down by histone H3, um, when doing RTQPCR, you have about 12 times uh, more fold enrichment compared to IgG pull down sample. So the IP efficiency was good enough. Unfortunately, um, we submitted our chip DNA for sequencing and we're still analyzing the data. So I can't really provide the uh, sequencing data for you guys at this talk. But fortunately, uh, hopefully, uh, you guys get an idea of how chip seek works and also some of the important things that needs to be considered for a successful um, result. So to summarize, SOD1 is in the nucleus and binds chromatin. And to know its binding site, uh, we utilize ChIP-seq. And we also explain some of the critical steps within the chip sample preparation workflow for sequencing. And that includes formaldehyde fixation, nuclear preparation using Nexin, and chromatin sharing and antibody specificity validation. And depending on which method that you use and also how much optimization that you use, um, it, really it really gives you a different yield. And so fixation time and chromatin sharing time has to be determined empirically. And also um, for IP, depending on which beads that you use, it really gives you different yields. So choosing the right method and uh, doing good optimization is critical to this chip six. So I would like to thank all of the people listed here, but especially Sean and Hamid and Mary from Covaris, uh, who helped me a lot. Um, they, every time I uh, uh, contacted them, their response was super quick and with a lot of tremendous help with technical support and stuff. Thank you. And I'd like to hand over to Hamid, and we be happy to get questions after his talk. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for coming. Uh, so today, what I want to do is I want to give you guys a brief description of the Covaris technology and some of the applications that we have standardized. Uh, I will go briefly into some of these applications, but if you require further information, please stop by our booth and we can go into further detail. 
Uh, so our mission at Covaris is fairly simple. We want to develop uh, technologies uh, that enable active sample processing uh, to uh, standardize clinical sample preparation. Uh, as many of you are aware, a lot of the clinical sample preparation methodologies uh, are quite aged. Uh, they've been in use for decades without having gone through any modification, whereas the analysis te uh, technologies have become significantly uh, more sensitive uh, in the meantime. So our goal is also to reduce the variability in sample preparation uh, that is the cause of a great majority of the variability seen in data analysis. Uh, we want to also simplify a lot of these workflows and accelerate the workflows to enable faster sample proper, uh, preparation uh, of clinical samples. Uh, we also want to enable the technology to be uh, um, automated, so integrated into liquid handlers, etc., so that a minimal hands-on time uh, is required for sample processing. So our technology is uh, is based on highly developed uh, technologies that are used in the medical field. We've taken a combination of both shockwave lithotripsy, which is used, uh, which is a high frequency focused acoustic system that is used to break kidney stones without damaging the adjacent tissue. And many of you are also aware of therapeutic ultrasound, uh, diagnostic ultrasound. We've taken these two technologies and developed it for biomolecule processing. We have over 80 patents that have uh, been granted and pending on the use of the technology. Uh, so all this technology is a cavitation-based uh, process. So cavitation, to describe it very simply, is when you have acoustic waves or sound waves traveling through a liquid medium, what happens is that the pressure waves cause the dissolved gases to come out of solution as microscopic air bubbles. When these air bubbles implode, fluids rush back in to fill that void, and that causes extreme shearing forces. And what we've been able to do at Covaris with our technology is to control not only the density of these cavitation bubbles, but also the speed at which they implode so we can have very tight control and tunability of the cavitation events that are occurring. So uh, we use a medical grade uh, ultrasonic transducer that generates very high frequency uh, sound in very short wavelengths. As compared to traditional sonicators that which require, uh, that operate in the 10 to 60 kilohertz range that require hearing protection or sound proof enclosures, our systems can sit on a bench top and do not make any sound. So it is, uh, it's very quiet. And also in terms of the uh, wavelengths, we operate at a three millimeter wavelength. So if you think of your sample tubes, they're typically no more than 10 millimeters in diameter. Uh, traditional sonicators operate at 10 to 15 centimeter wavelength, which means that a lot of that excess energy is wasted and wasted as heat. So uh, we use a spherically designed transducer, as you can see on the left-hand uh, image. And what that does, it focuses all the acoustic waves to a very small focal point that's about the size of a grain of rice. So that's where all the cavitation events are occurring when you're processing a sample with the Covaris system. And what this allows us to do is to use significantly less input energy to initiate cavitation and process samples. So as compared to, let's say, a bass sonicator or a probe sonicator, we use about 150 times times less energy. Using less energy means that less heat is, ge is, is generated during sample processing. And you can see that by an experiment that we did in the house, uh, comparing a bass sonicator and probe sonicator to Covaris systems. And what we did, we took publication uh, settings from publications to shear DNA to 200 base pairs. And then we used uh, temperature sensors to monitor the temperature in the water bath, as well as inside the sample and on the sample tube. So as you can see, for bass sonicators and probe sonicators, there's a wide range of temperature gradient within your sample and with your sample tube. With, with uh, the Covaris uh, system, it's basically isothermal. It doesn't generate any heat uh, during processing, uh, the, so you can keep your samples that are liable, uh, for example, chromatin, that's beyond mentioned, or DNA, so you could have unbiased shearing. 
So this control uh, that we have over uh, adaptive focused acoustics or covariance AFA enables the utilization of many different applications that are listed here. Uh, so we'll just go through a few of them that we have standardized. Many of you are aware that covariance technology is the gold standard for DNA sharing and clinical uh, NGS. Practically all of the CLIA CAP certified labs that do clinical sequencing use covariance systems for the DNA sharing uh, for, uh, for their library prep. So uh, we have standardized also epigenetics workflows, as uh, Beyond mentioned CHIP. We have quite a few CHIP products that are uh, have enabled standardization of CHIP. We have, uh, last year we had about a thousand uh, peer-reviewed journals, uh, articles that mentioned Covar specifically. This year we're already surpassing 2,000. So the rate of people using Covar systems for uh, CHIP has increased dramatically because we've been able to standardize the workflow and it works consistently and reproducibly uh, every single time and it maintains the epitope integrity because it doesn't generate any heat you don't lose the DNA protein interaction uh, that you have uh, cross-linked uh, with formaldehyde. We recently also standardized another workflow uh, that is going to be very near and dear to a lot of clinicians, uh, especially uh, dealing with, F uh, with FFPE samples. To date, FFPE samples used in chromatin IP has been practically impossible. There's only been a few publications that have shown that, but the workflows are incredibly uh, inefficient and very long. We've been able to do FFPE chip now, and we can do it in a 40 minutes and in a high throughput fashion. It's a very uh, standardized workflow that we have developed. It's three times faster than the current protocols that have been published, and it's very high throughput, and we would like to talk to you more about that if you want to process uh, FFPE samples for CHIP. Well, we've also standardized uh, FFPE DNA extraction uh, and RNA extraction uh, from FFPE sections for clinical samples. Uh, and uh, this is basically a publication that came out just a couple of months ago uh, that compared all the total nucleic acid extraction kits available on the market on clinical samples. And they, they indicated that the, with Covaris uh, technology, they were able to get higher fragments of RNA, so their DV2 100 scores were much higher and they indicated that they had a reduced number of failures because Covaris uh, the kits that they used uh, extracted significantly more DNA than the, uh, some of the comp uh, competing kits. They've also indicated that with some of the competing kits they had missed some of the fusion events in their analysis whereas with the Covaris uh, extraction kit they were able to see those uh, fusion events uh, and identify those. Uh, our technology is also usable, our kits, uh, our true extract kits have also been used in laser capture uh, microdissected FFPE samples and in this publication they indicated that they were able to get uh, an increased yield of 8 to 12 folds as compared to other methodologies for extraction of DNA from LCM samples. And they also indicated that their CT values were 2.3 folds uh, lower as compared to some of the other methodologies that were used for extracting DNA from these very small uh, sample masses. We've also been able to sh indicate, uh, show that Covaris technology can be used in cell-free DNA extraction. And in a recent uh, um, experiment we carried out with uh, one of our customers, they were able to show that they were able to pick up with their digital P PCR assays, they were able to pick up mutations that were missed by other uh, extraction methodologies. So this is certainly uh, another way of using Covaris technology to extract much better sample material uh, for clinical analysis. And, uh, and, and in this uh, experiment, uh, we actually took uh, uh, cell-free DNA uh, plasma samples from two more origins from five different tissues uh, and um, uh, 16 uh, different patients and compared the, the distribution of the cell-free DNA uh, that has been extracted using both a Kyogen kit and a Covaris kit. And as you can see, the distribution varies widely with the, Covar with the Kyogen extracted uh, cell-free DNA, whereas it's much tighter uh, and much more consistent with the Covaris uh, extracted cell-free DNA. 
So we've also standardized clinical NGS uh, even further. We recently introduced our Covirus One tube, which is a polymer acoustic friendly uh, uh, polymer design that allows you to process samples uh, in 96 well format and carry it through the rest of the NGS workflow in the same tube. In the past with Covirus technology, what you had to do is to process samples in our glass tubes and then transfer them into a PCR plate for the end repair and library prep stage steps. Now you no longer have to do that. You can shear in our polymer tubes uh, to whatever size range you're looking for and uh, do all your downstream uh, end repair uh, and even uh, uh, your cleanups directly on uh, the, uh, the one tube plates. So um, in 2019, we're also introducing a new instrument called the R230. This is an instrument that is, uh, as you can see uh, on the image, sitting on a liquid handler. It'll sit on a liquid handler, so now if you have your uh, NGS workflow automated already, uh, your library prep automated already, you can use, uh, you can put one of our instruments on your liquid handler and do the shearing steps and some of the other subsequent steps directly using Covars technology without having to transfer plates uh, and tubes. So this should automate and enhance the workflow uh, significantly. Uh, we recently also uh, did um, uh, had uh, a presentation uh, by a group at uh, the NCI, which used our technology for extraction of uh, DNA from microbiome samples, which is a hot topic in many of the um, uh, conferences these days. They were able to show that as compared to current methodologies that are used, which is bead beading, to extract, uh, uh, to lyse uh, these uh, cells from the microbiome communities, we were able to show that, they were able to show that we were getting significantly higher amount of DNA uh, for extraction. But uh, more importantly, they were able to show that the alpha diversity of the samples processed with Covarus AFA were significantly higher uh, than compared to samples that were processed uh, with bead beading. And we can share this data even more and talk about it more if you want to come to our booth. Um, they, uh, and more importantly, what they showed that the beta diversity and the unique uh, number of species or genres uh, that were identified with Covars uh, were significantly higher. With bead beating, uh, with Covars uh, AFA processing, they were able to identify 46 unique uh, um, ODUs that were completely missed with, uh, with uh, bead beating. So this is another application of the technology and the control of tunable technology that allows sample processing even with microbiome samples that are very difficult to process. So uh, in summary, uh, we, everyone does agree, and, and there have been quite a few publications on this, that 80% of the variability that's seen from clinical samples uh, in the data analysis slide is, uh, starts, begins at the sample preparation. So our goal is to simplify that workflow uh, and uh, automate it as much as we can and use active methodology rather than passive technologies for extraction of biomolecules uh, for sample processing. So if you have any workflows that you would like to, uh, to utilize active methods of extraction, biomolecule processing, please come by our booth, booth 1515, and we would like to talk to you about that. Thank you.